All right. Rex, are we ready with him on the line? All right. Jeff Green is from the Federal Trade Commission and is with the Division of Anti-Competitive Practices. He is the Assistant Director and a graduate of Harvard uh, Law School. He has done a lot of work in this area and in conversations that Dory was having with people from other states, it became clear to her and then to me and us that we perhaps needed to have a little more information in this area. So we're very fortunate that Mr. Green, who is three hours ahead of us, so it's 5 o'clock back oh. east, uh, is joining us to update us on antitrust considerations for regulating the practice of law. Uh, we do have a PowerPoint that Rex will be forwarding as uh, Mr. Green requests. I also just, uh, on a personal note, want to let you know I had a chemo this weekend, which I am, as you know, every other week, and I'm having uh, more side effects today than I sometimes have. So if I just get up and leave, know that I'm fine, know that I'm coming back, and know that Dory will run the meeting in my absence, and then anything I miss, I'll watch on the video and read the notes. It may be that I don't leave the room at all. It's just been uh, kind of one of those days so far, so I just don't want you to be like, what's Mary doing? Where is she going? What's, is she okay? I am okay. I will be okay. Um, so with that, Mr. Green, too much information for you probably. But uh, thank you for joining us, and uh, please begin at your, uh, pl your pleasure. Sure, sure. thank you, and, and, and best wishes uh, you. To, to you, Chief Justice. Good afternoon. Uh, my, my presentation today addresses antitrust law and policy as it relates to the regulation of lawyers. I will describe the types of regulatory actions that are most likely to raise competition issues. Then I will discuss the antitrust state action exemption, including steps that a bar association may take to minimize the risk of inadvertently violating the antitrust laws. I will be focusing on the Supreme Court's most recent state action decision, North Carolina State Board of Dental Examiners v. Federal Trade Commission, and the implications of this case for attorney regulation. Uh, before we start, I'd like to thank the work group for organizing this program and for inviting me to participate. And one final preliminary notice is an important and sincere disclaimer. This presentation expresses my views it does not necessarily represent the views of the Federal Trade Commission or of any individual commissioner. It, uh, if, if we could advance to slide two now, it's, uh, hopefully it's, it's headed summary. I, I will start with a summary of the principal points that you should keep in mind as you consider how best to construct a framework for the regulation of lawyers that will be consistent with the antitrust laws. First, from an antitrust perspective, it is beneficial, where possible, to invest regulatory responsibility for the legal profession with the state Supreme Court. The reason is this. The state Supreme Court, act acting in a legislative capacity, is always exempt from antitrust liability. When the Supreme Court promulgates the, a code of ethics or prescribes who may engage in the practice of law, it is acting in a legislative, not adjudicatory capacity. So the surest way to avoid antitrust issues is to have the Supreme Court serve as the regulator for lawyers. Point two, for antitrust purposes, the State Bar Association occupies a status different from the State Supreme Court. The State Bar is not always exempt from antitrust review. This is true even where the State Bar is constituted as a state agency. From an antitrust perspective, the state bar is not very different from any other private professional association or trade association, such as the American Medical Association or the National Association of Realtors. Point three, under conditions that we will discuss shortly, the state bar or a bar association can be cloaked with an antitrust exemption. I will talk about two related lines of cases one specific to a state bar when it is operating under the supervision and direction of the state Supreme Court. The bar association is exempt from antitrust liability where it is assisting, where the real party in interest, the real decision maker, is the Supreme Court. 
The second line of cases derives from the, the MidCal decision. MidCal permits the state bar or any private actors to gain an antitrust exemption when its conduct is broadly authorized by the state and its specific conduct is supervised by an independent state actor. Under MidCal, that supervisor for the bar does not have to be the Supreme Court. However, the supervisor may not be a person or persons actively engaged in the practice of law. Point four, finally, is very important. Please bear in mind that to say that the regulatory activity of the state bar is not exempt does not mean that the regulatory activity is prohibited by antitrust law. Let me turn that around. Many forms of reasonable and valuable professional regulation are fully consistent with the antitrust laws. So a regulatory body does not necessarily need an exemption to avoid liability. Uh, please move to slide three. Yeah, it is uh, worthwhile, I think, to spend a few minutes outlining some antitrust basics. Antitrust law addresses restrictions on competition that have the effect of harming consumers. Restrictions on abusive or dishonest business practices are not prohibited. Pro-competitive, pro-consumer self-regulation of a profession is fully consistent with the antitrust laws. It is also quite common. It seems that every trade, trade group has an association in Washington, D.C., representing its interests, from psychologists to piano teachers to engineers to real estate agents. It is very common for these associations to have in place a code of ethics, rules that discourage or prohibit deception, fraud, false advertising, self-dealing, or similar abusive trade practices are permissible. It is also common for professional associations to have in place a disciplinary mechanism. If a member violates the ethical standards of the association, he may be censured or suspended or excluded from membership in the association. Antitrust law prohibits certain restrictions on competition that harm consumers. Section two of the Sherman Act prohibits monopolization and attempted monopolization, where a single firm gains or maintains control of a market through improper means. This rarely comes into play when we are addressing markets for professional services where there are hundreds or thousands of rivals. Section 1 of the Sherman Act prohibits agreements that harm competition and consumers. For example, agreements among rivals that raise fees or prices, restrict output, diminish quality, or interfere with innovation. So here is a rule of thumb for professional regulation. If an ethics rule enriches the practitioners, enriches the practitioners, but confers no significant benefit upon the clients, check with your antitrust counsel. You may be headed toward antitrust liability. Uh, move, please, to slide four. On slide four, I have listed some of the types of agreements that have been adopted by professional associ associations and engendered antitrust problems for the group. At the top of the list is agreements on fees. In general, consumers benefit when sellers are free to negotiate fees with consumers without interference or intervention from or coordination with rivals. This may seem too obvious even to mention. One may think that a bar association would not even consider regulating fees, but this was not always true. Until the Goldfarb case in the U.S. Supreme Court in 1975, the Virginia State Bar issued and local bar associations enforced a minimum fee schedule for certain legal services. The U.S. Supreme Court concluded that, that this arrangement was unlawful. The SCTLA case involved attorneys who were paid by the government of Washington, D.C., to provide legal services for indigent defendants in criminal cases. As it happened, these lawyers were paid very little. In response, the attorneys agreed to withhold services until compensation was increased. 
in a sense, to go on strike. The Supreme Court concluded that this... No names are available. Am I, am I still on? Yeah, sorry for that, Mr. Green. When people introduce themselves, when they come in, you get a little intro- um, interruption, but just keep going. Okay, I will barrel through. Uh, so uh, the, the, the members of the Lawyers Association in Washington, D.C. agreed to withhold services in effect to go on strike. The Supreme Court concluded that this joint effort to raise legal fees violated the antitrust laws. The reverse situation is also a problem. Law firms need to compete for associates and other employees and should not agree on the salaries that will be paid. Law firms should not agree to forgo recruiting or hiring one another's associates. Recent guidance from the Department of Justice indicates that these so-called no-poaching agreements can be criminal violations. Remember also that clients are not the property of a law firm. Agreements not to compete for particular clients are disfavored by antitrust law. Historically, many associations, including the legal profession, have been hostile to advertising and solicitation of clients, thinking that it was sometimes not consistent with the dignity of a professional to actively seek out business. Antitrust law has a different perspective. Advertising is considered an important tool for promoting competitive markets. Restrictions on truthful, non-deceptive advertising are viewed with skepticism by antitrust enforcers. Also viewed with skepticism are rules that interfere with innovative business practices. If the, if the justification for prescribing a form of competition is that it unfairly disadvantages the established firms or established practitioners, then again, you may be treading close to the line of an antitrust violation. Another broad area of potential concern between professional regulation and antitrust law involves rules of exclusion, the exclusion of actual or potential competitors. Competitor exclusion is at the heart of a licensing program. Licensing is an effort to divide would-be providers into qualified and underqualified. Underqualified providers are denied a license and barred from competing. The concept of exclusion is also central to antitrust analysis. Antitrust law views exclusion as a potential mechanism of competitive harm. If you exclude new entrants or force rivals to exit the market, then the incumbent suppliers may be able to raise prices. If you exclude low-cost providers of a service, again, the result may be higher prices for consumers. If you exclude innovators, then the quality and range of services may be lessened. So a state bar needs to think carefully about the rules that define, that define admission to the bar, that define who may compete to provide legal services to clients. Also think carefully about the rules that determine when a license is suspended or revoked. In large markets, the exclusion of a single service provider or even several providers may have only a de minimis effect on competition, and for this reason may not violate the antitrust laws. Policies that exclude an entire class of potential rivals are more likely to trigger antitrust liability. A related topic is, rule, a related topic is rules defining the boundaries of the profession. These boundary rules must be considered in conjunction with the admission rules for the profession. For example, one may ask, is it reasonable, does it benefit consumers to to require three years of law school and continuing education in order to practice law? The answer to that question may depend upon how we define the practice of law. Are we talking about representing a defendant accused of a crime or are we talking about who may assist in filling out a form? Slide five, please. Before we move on to the subject of exemptions from the antitrust laws, let me offer one important clarification. I don't want you to think that the rules concerning collusion and exclusion that I have been discussing are an impediment to the efficient management of a law firm. 
antitrust analysis of the permissibility or reasonableness of a, restra- of a restraint depends in substantial part on the relationship, if any, among the parties to the agreement. Assume, then, that we are concerned with a, with a law firm, a partnership among lawyers who might otherwise compete with one another. The antitrust rules governing the relationship among the members of a single firm are quite permissive. The members of the firm can collectively determine the fee structure for the firm without incurring liability for price fixing. The members of the firm can collectively determine compensation for the firm's associates and other employees. The members can agree not to compete with one another for clients or to specialize in different distinct practice areas. Decisions about who is a member of the firm and who will be excluded do not implicate the antitrust laws. When antitrust lawyers warn against price fixing, market division, restraints on entry, we have in mind restraints that cut across the that cut across the profession, not rules regulating a particular law firm. There is an intermediate category, restraints that reach across multiple firms, but less than the entire industry. I will skip over this category for now, but if there are questions, we can come back to this topic. Slide six, please. We have been, dis- we have been discussing the types of conduct by a bar association that may harm competition and give rise to antitrust liability. The next subject is exemptions. There are circumstances in which the antitrust laws do not apply, where other policy objectives take precedence. Specifically, what happens when a regulatory program adopted by a state conflicts with the pro-competitive economic policy represented by the Sherman Act? What law has primacy or precedence in the event of a conflict? The answer is found in a body of court decisions referred to as the Antitrust State Action Doctrine. The central precept of the State Action Doctrine is this. In passing the Sherman Act, Congress did not intend to prevent states from regulating their own economies or even from adopting anti-competitive forms of economic regulation. Stated affirmatively, a restraint that represents or constitutes the regulatory policy of the state will be be exempt from antitrust liability. The state action doctrine is fundamentally a product of statutory interpretation, but the court's understanding of the limited reach of of the Sherman Act is informed by principles of federalism and state sovereignty. States may regulate the market for legal services and do not have to rely on the free market to determine price or quality or who may participate. The state action doctrine originates with the case Parker v. Brown. In Parker, the court considered a challenge to a state to a California statute that, in its implementation, restricted the volume of agricultural products that could be sold by individual growers in California. Critics of the regulatory scheme charged that the California legislation was facilitating the formation of a raisin cartel, a cartel of raisin growers. The Supreme Court recognized this tension between state and federal policy and concluded that state policy should prevail. Parker holds that the official acts of the legislature necessarily represent the regulatory policy of the state and are always exempt from antitrust liability. The Bates case in 1977 extended this principle to the actions of a state's highest court. The state Supreme Court also is the sovereign and when acting in its legislative capacity also is exempt from antitrust liability. In Bates, Two attorneys were temporarily suspended from the practice of law in Arizona for violating a disciplinary rule that prohibited most lawyer advertising. The the Arizona Supreme Court had incorporated the ABA's advertising prohibition into the local Supreme Court rules. 
the U.S. Supreme Court ultimately concluded that the advertising ban violated the First Amendment, but it first held that the state that the state Supreme Court was immune from Sherman Act liability because its enforcement of the disciplinary rule was state action. Now, as a practical matter, the members of the state Supreme Court do not have the ability on their own fully to regulate the legal profession. In many states, the court's regulatory mission is of course assisted by the bar, by an entity made up of those individuals licensed to practice law in the state. Bates and Hoover v. Ronwin established, that, established the proposition that the conduct of the state bar incidental to, to the Supreme Court's exercise of its sovereign authority is exempt from antitrust scrutiny. Turn to slide seven, please. The setting in the Hoover case is the Arizona licensing regime for, for attorneys. The plaintiff was a law school graduate seeking admission to the Arizona bar. The plaintiff received a failing grade on the bar exam and was denied a license. Defendants were members of a state agency called the Committee on Examinations and Admissions. This is a group of attorneys appointed by the Arizona Supreme Court and tasked with administering the bar admissions process. The committee was responsible for grading the examinations. The plaintiff's antitrust claim was, was that the committee adopted a grading formula designed to limit the number of successful applicants and to do so without regard to competence. The allegation was that grading was manipulated and that competent applicants were rejected in order to, to protect incumbent attorneys from competition. The, the U.S. Supreme Court rejected this antitrust claim because the committee was so closely supervised by the Arizona S Supreme Court, by the sovereign. The Arizona S Supreme Court specified the subjects, subjects to be tested and required the committee to submit its grading formula to the court in advance of each examination. The committee recommended applicants for admissions to the bar but the court made the final decision to admit or reject each applicant. In addition, a disappointed applicant could seek individualized review of his application by the court. The U.S. Supreme Court concluded that the party responsible for excluding the plaintiff and other allegedly competent law school graduates was not the practicing lawyers on the committee, but rather the Supreme Court, the Arizona Supreme Court was said to be, quote, the real party in interest. Here is what we learned from the Hoover case. If I am a state bar association that is charged with excluding would-be competitors or any other potentially anti-competitive activity, I would like to be able to say to the antitrust court, it wasn't me. The bar was not responsible for this allegedly anti-competitive restraint. Sure, the bar advised, the bar implemented, the bar assisted, but it was the Supreme Court that directed the actions that ultimately, that ultimately made the decisions. The real party in interest was the court, therefore dismissed, dismissed the antitrust claim against the bar. Sl slide eight. In Bates and Hoover v. v. Ronwin, the state bar gains an antitrust exemption because it operates as an appendage or agent of the state Supreme Court. As I noted at the outset, there is a second line of state action cases delineating an antitrust defense that is not specific to the regulation of attorneys. This line of cases originates with MidCal. Recall that the purpose of state action defense is to create space for the regulation of economic affairs by the state, typically the legislature, without interference from the federal antitrust laws. The Supreme Court has recognized, however, that, this, that for this policy to be effective, non-sovereign entities that are responsible 
for implementing or effectuating the policy of the sovereign also need to be protected from antitrust liability. Just as the state Supreme Court does not operate independently, the legislature does not operate independently. And so we have the Mid-Cal Doctrine. The anti-competitive acts of private parties are entitled to state action exemption if a two-part test is satisfied. First, the challenged conduct must be taken pursuant to a clearly articulated and affirmatively expressed state policy to displace competition with regulation. Second, the conduct must be actively supervised by a qualified state actor. I will have more to say about the two prongs of the Mid-Cal test in a moment, but first uh, let me discuss Town of Halley. In Town of Halley, the Supreme Court adopted a more permissive standard for identifying state action where the defendant is a a municipality. A city may invoke the state action defense by satisfying prong one of the Mid-Cal standard, the clear articulation requirement. The active supervision prong is is not applicable to a municipality. Why? Cities are treated more permissively, are not subject to the active state supervision requirement because they have less of an incentive to pursue their own interest under the guise of implementing state policies. Where the state broadly authorizes interference with competition, the city is trusted to implement the details. So this is the legal landscape leading up to the dental board case. We have a more permissive antitrust standard applicable to cities and other governmental actors, and a more demanding antitrust standard applicable to private actors that purport to be implementing state policy. The open question was, how do we analyze conduct by a hybrid actor, part governmental and part private? More specifically, how do we address a state agency consisting of or controlled by competitors, by persons who have a financial interest in the market that is being regulated? Slide nine, please. This brings us to the dental board case. The North Carolina legislature delegated authority to regulate dentistry to a board consisting largely of practicing dentists. The conduct under review involved defining the boundaries of the profession of dentistry. Non-licensed persons, non-dentists, were providing teeth whitening services in malls and salons in competition with the state's licensed dentists. Dentists complained to the state dental board. The North Carolina Dental Act prohibits the practice of dentistry except by persons who are licensed by the board. However, However, the statute is silent on whether this prohibition covers teeth whitening. The the relevant practice, bleaching teeth with peroxide, did not exist when the statute was first enacted. Therefore, the determination of whether non-dentists may lawfully provide teeth whitening services requires interpretation of generally worded statutory provisions. Exercising its discretion, the Dental Board decided that in North Carolina, teeth whitening constitutes the practice of dentistry and directed non-licensed persons to cease and desist. This discretionary act excluded non-dentists, reduced consumer choice, and raised the price to consumers of, of obtaining teeth whitening services. The FTC initiated an antitrust action against the Dental Board. The Supreme Court concluded that governmental entities controlled by active market participants are treated like private trade associations vested by states with regulatory authority. Both prongs of the Mid-Cal test must be satisfied or there is no antitrust exemption. This holding reflects a recognition or judgment that when a state empowers a group of active market participants to decide who can compete in a market, there is a structural risk that they will pursue their own interests 
instead of the state's policy goals. As the, as the board's discretionary action, the exclusion of non-dentist teeth whiteners was not actively supervised, the antitrust court, the, I'm sorry, the antitrust state action defense was inapplicable. The court upheld the FTC's finding that the state dental board had violated the antitrust laws. Slide 10, please. Here is the court's holding. A state board on which a controlling number of decision makers are active market participants in the occupation the board regulates must satisfy MidCal's active supervision requirement in order to invoke state action immunity. This is the directive that has created something of a tizzy in the world of state regulatory boards, including bar associations. Slide 11. Following the dental board case, the first step in assessing whether a state regulatory entity is exempt from antitrust liability is to determine whether the entity is controlled by active state, by active market participants. For some state regulatory entities, this may, may be a complicated question. For example, a state health board may contain some practitioners and some lay consumer representatives and some government employees. In this scenario, it may be challenging to, to determine where control lies. For a typical bar association, this will not be a close or difficult question. Typically, licensed lawyers control the bar association. They do not share control with non-lawyers. So, as with the North Carolina Dental Board, both prongs of the MidCal test will be applicable to a state bar. And if the decisions are made by a committee of the bar, and that committee consists entirely of lawyers, then again, both prongs of the MidCal test will be applicable. One question that has been posed is this. Suppose that there is a disciplinary action against a lawyer and the decision makers are lawyers, but not direct competitors of the respondent. Perhaps the respondent is from the northern part of the state and the decision makers are from the south. Or the lawyer or the respondent is a tax lawyer and the decision makers practice in other areas of the law. Does this change the analysis? Although not entirely free from doubt, the likely answer is that the active supervision requirement will apply in this scenario. In the Goldfarb case that I referenced earlier, the Virginia State Bar regulated fees for, the title, for title searches, but the Supreme Court did not concern itself with whether the lawyers setting the fees did or did not practice in this area. For purposes of state action analysis, it was sufficient that the persons setting the fee schedule were lawyers. Lawyers were regulating lawyers. This dynamic created a sufficient risk of competitive harm. Another scenario, suppose that the decision makers on the disciplinary committee are retired lawyers with no intention of ever practicing law again. Arguably, they have no personal financial interest in, in excluding anyone from practicing. Does, does this reduce the antitrust risk or change the antitrust analysis? The answer is that no case has addressed this scenario. Arguably, however, the retired attorneys are not active market participants. Slide 12, please. For purposes of discussion, let us assume that we have an antitrust claim against the state bars and that both prongs of the, med of the mid -cal test are applicable. How do we establish a valid state action defense? Prong one, the defendant must show that the alleged anti-competitive conduct was taken pursuant to a clearly articulated state policy to replace competition with regulation. The state policy must come from the legislature or the state Supreme Court. Both are sovereign. The clear articulation standard is satisfied 
if the anti-competitive effect challenged by the antitrust plaintiff was the foreseeable result of what the state authorized. Stated differently, the displacement of competition should be the inherent, logical, or ordinary result of the exercise of authority delegated by the state legislature. To satisfy the clear articulation test, a state legislature need not expressly state that it intends for the delegated action to have anti-competitive effects, and the legislature need not authorize specific anti-competitive effects. So here is an example. Suppose the state legislature creates a licensing regime for lawyers and empowers the Bar Association to determine which applicants are sufficiently qualified to provide legal services. There is a strong argument that the legislature in creating these entry barriers foresaw and intended the displacement of competition with regulation. Or more precisely, the legislature contemplated certain types of regulation. The legislature arguably contemplated that the bar would set eligibility rules, such as a rule that an applicant must graduate from an accredited law school. In contrast, the legislative action that I have described does not contemplate restrictions on attorney advertising. In considering the legislature's delegation of authority to the Bar Association, the more detailed the delegation, the better off the Bar Association will be in terms of antitrust exposure. If the legislature spells out specifically that the Bar applicant must graduate from an accredited law school and defines the accreditation formula, then those decisions can <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> then those decisions cannot be challenged under the antitrust laws. If discretion is delegated to the Bar Association, <clears throat> then that discretion needs to be supervised. Okay, <clears throat> on to slide 13, please. <clears throat> if we conclude that a particular regulatory agency <clears throat> is controlled, I'm going to take a minute here. Talking a long time, and we really appreciate it. Okay, my apologies. If we conclude that a particular regulatory agency <clears throat> is controlled by active, <clears throat> by active market participants and that active supervision is required, what constitutes active supervision? <clears throat> the basic principle of decision is that the state's supervision mechanism should provide realistic assurance that the agency's conduct promotes state action <clears throat> rather than the interests of the market participants. As a start, the, supervisor, the supervisory regime must in fact review the substance of the agency's decision. The potential for review is not sufficient. And the supervisor must engage with the substance of the, of the decision and not simply the procedures followed by the state agency. The supervisor must have the power to approve, veto, or modify particular decisions to ensure that they accord with state policy. If the supervisor merely rubber stamps the actions of the agency, this is not active supervision. So how does an antitrust court determine whether the supervisor has been conscientious as opposed to acting as the proverbial rubber stamp? The FTC and the lower courts have identified relevant factors, some markers that the supervision has been serious. First, consider whether the supervisor has sought and obtained the information necessary for a proper evaluation. The supervisor should not necessarily be limited to considering the information gathered by the agency that is being supervised. 
Second, consider whether the supervisor has in fact evaluated the substantive merits of the agency's proposed action and determined whether the proposed action comports with the standards established by the state legislature. Third, has the supervisor issued a written decision explaining the rationale for its action? These steps are perhaps not necessary in all circumstances. There may be other ways to establish and evidence active supervision, but if the supervisor does, does these three things, you are reasonably safe. Uh, next slide, slide 14, please. In reviewing commentary addressing the North Carolina Dental Board decision, I have seen one area of confusion and, uh, and uncertainty. This is the question, what are the criteria by which the state supervisor should evaluate the discretionary actions of the agency? First, Supreme Court decisions make clear that a substantive review of the agency's actions is required. The supervisor must review the substance of the decision, not merely the procedures followed by the agency to produce it. In this substantive review, the supervisor may employ a consumer welfare standard, as in the antitrust law, but is not required to do so. The legislature may instruct the supervisor to prefer high quality without regard to cost. The legislature may instruct the supervisor to preference incumbent suppliers. The policy objective can be whatever the state sovereign directs, except that the state may not direct the supervisor to defer to the policy profession, to, de, to the policy preferences of the private market participants that populate and control the state agency. Suppose that the supervisor approves or is, or is required to approve a proposed restraint on competition based on a finding that the agency's actions were within the discretion delegated by the agent, to the agency by the state legislature. This likely is not active supervision. The Supreme Court's concern in North Carolina Dental Board is not that the board has acted outside its statutory authority. Rather, the concern is that in exercising its discretion, in addressing matters left open by the state legislature, the board promoted the interests of its dentist members instead of promoting the interests of the state. Any supervision mechanism in which the supervisor is obliged to defer to the legal, factual, or policy conclusions of the agency poses a risk. The discretion of the supervisor should not be circumscribed by the agency that it is supervising. So in my judgment, the supervisor cannot be bound to uphold the agency solely because the agency's actions are judged reasonable or solely because the board's actions are judged not arbitrary, not arbitrary and capricious. What is required is more akin to a de novo review. Slide 15, please. Last issue, who may act as a supervisor? The Supreme Court has expressly instructed that the supervisor may not be an active market participant. Subject to this restraint, states have a good deal of flexibility. The real challenge for states, the real challenge for states is not who legally may serve as a supervisor, but rather determining what entity or institution is best suited to serve this function. Recall that this is essentially a policy-making function. You want some entity with the skills, resources, and competence to serve as a policymaker. Several states have within the executive branch an umbrella state agency that has authority over the state's occupational licensing boards. Where such an agency exists or can be created, it seems sensible to have that agency serve as the supervisor for state action purposes. In some states, a committee of the state legislature is empowered to review agency regulations. There are reasons, however, why elected legislators may not be best suited to act as the, as the state action supervisor. In the event of an antitrust challenge, the supervisor needs to be able to answer questions about the process, 
perhaps at trial or in a deposition. What steps did you take to evaluate the proposed regulation? What information was available to you? What information did you consider? Elected officials may not be accustomed to or, comfor or comfortable with answering these questions. Finally, states may consider whether lower courts would be an effective supervisor. Remember, however, that the state action review process is different from the review, from the review process that courts are accustomed to. As discussed earlier, the supervisor is not checking that the board has acted reasonably or lawfully. The supervisor is in, is in a policymaking role. I have, I have somehow slipped over some slides, skipped over some slides. So I'm going to go backwards. Halley and Midcal. So right now we have the who may act as a supervisor slide up. Let's go, let's go back to slide. Did, did, I, did, did, did I skip over slide 12, the clear articulation requirement? I think I did. Let's go to slide 12. Okay, we're there. Okay. All right. So uh, as I said, there, there are two prongs to the Midcal test clear articulation and, and active supervision. Somehow I've managed to skip over the, the clear articulation uh, requirement. I think you did do it. Did, did, did I discuss that? Yes, you did. I think that's when you were okay. having your coughing. Uh, okay, that's when, I was having my, that's when I was having my coughing fit? Yes. Uh, okay. I, I, I'm sorry. sorry. Okay. All right, then, 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 then let's go to, to slides, on to slide 16. Uh, so slide 16 is a, is a, is a recap in, in question and answer form. Qu question, what is being supervised? The exercise of policy discretion by market participants. Why is supervision deemed necessary? The antitrust court cannot be confident that the actions of market participants necessarily further state policy. Question, what is the purpose or function of supervision? Answer, to ensure that the restraint is... I'm sorry? To ensure that the restraint at issue advances state policy as opposed to private interests. Question, why is this distinction important? Because antitrust enforcement defers only to the policy preferences of, of the state, not to the preferences of state actors. If, if we have just another minute, I'll, I'll give you uh, a, sh a short description of the NOR defense on slide 17. Please, Mr. Green, whatever you'd like. Okay. On, on slide 17, moving now from the state action discussion, an antitrust defense separate from state action is the NOR defense. State action and NOR are complementary expressions of the principle that antitrust laws regulate business, not politics. The state action defense protects the state's active governing, and the NOR defense protects the citizens' participation in government. NOR teaches that bona fide efforts to petition or persuade the state government or any governmental agency to take actions that have the effect of harming competition are generally immune from antitrust liability. For those regulating the legal profession, a leading case to consider is Law, law Line versus American Bar Association. Plaintiff Law Line was an associ association made up of law students, paralegals, and lawyers. Members of the association answered legal questions from the public over the telephone and without charge, and then referred cases to lawyers who agreed to charge reduced fees. The business model ran afoul of two legal rules recommended by the ABA and adopted by the Illinois Supreme Court. One rule forbid lawyers from assisting laypersons in the unauthorized practice of law, 
and the second rule forbid lawyers from entering into partnerships with non-lawyers if the activities of the partnership included the practice of law. Lawline sued the ABA, claiming that, that these ethics rules were an anti-competitive effort to protect traditional law firms. However, under the NOR doctrine, the actions of the ABA in lobbying for these rules in influencing the court to adopt these rules were immune from antitrust liability. Lawline also challenged certain ethics opinions issued by the Illinois State Bar opining that Lawline's conduct violated the Illinois Rules of Professional Conduct. The rules of conduct when adopted by the state Supreme Court are state action. The Bar Association's ethics opinions are not state action. Still, the Seventh Circuit concluded that the ethics opinions did not violate the antitrust laws. The Seventh Circuit concluded that it was the court's promulgation and enforcement of challenged ethics rules and not the bar's interpretation of those rules that had the effect of restraining competition. In general, then, when a bar association provides information or advice but does not constrain others to conform, it does not violate the antitrust laws. Uh, I hope that uh, this presentation has been helpful and that uh, my voice is carried. I'd be happy to, ca to answer any questions that you have, either now or you may contact me later at the FTC. Thank you, Mr. Green. It was very helpful and uh, very understandable, at least to me, and I appreciate that. Um, we have come to the end of the allotted time that you had asked for, but if there are any current questions, since we have you on the phone and you've offered, I'd like to um, see if any of the work group members would like to ask any, any questions at all. Uh, Eileen Farley. Um, I have, I think, two questions, Mr. Green. Thank you for your presentation. Um, is it correct to assume that when looking at supervision, that not all of an entity's actions must be supervised to qualify for the defense, but only those that are potentially have a potential non-competition effect? Let, let, let me answer this, this way. Uh, if, if there's no anti-competitive harm, or then you don't need an anti, then you don't need an exemption from the antitrust laws. You're just complying with the antitrust laws. So, so the, the mid-cal requirements are applicable if you need to or seek to invoke an antitrust exemption. So, so to the extent that you're in, engaging in conduct that doesn't raise significant competition issues, you needn't worry about mid-cal or or North Carolina Dental. It's, it's when you begin to engage in conduct that, that may have uh, anti-competitive effects that you want to uh, consider doing it in such a way that you can invoke the exemption. And when, and I realize you're not speaking for the FTC, when a particular action is being evaluated for possible non-competition effect, does that evaluation, does the action stand alone or does the evaluation include the broader context? And here I'm thinking of, uh, in this state bar, there have been uh, an addition for what are called limited, limited license legal technicians or li and limited practice officers, which have, have broadened in an effort to provide greater access to legal services. Would a possible non, some, the only left-handed people, I'm left-handed, can be lawyers, would, would such a, an action be evaluated in the context of all the steps taken to broaden access or would each action have to stand on its own and be evaluated on its own? I hope that was clear. Uh, 
I, I, I can't give you a, a kind of a, a categorical answer. It, it could be that a series of actions by uh, an antitrust defendant are, are so linked that you can only understand the competitive effects by evaluating them in the entirety. Uh, but there are also examples where courts have singled out a particular ethics rule or a particular action by a professional group and said it's sufficiently distinct that uh, it's not redeemed by by other conduct that that the actor is in, in, engaged in. Uh, so, and I, I'm I'm not sure if that's really a a, a helpful answer, but 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 in the absence of more details, uh, I'm I'm not sure I can do any better. No, thank you. I. I didn't expect that there would be some bright line for us, but I thought I'd give it a shot. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, hearing none, Mr. Green, thank you very much for your um, participation. We greatly appreciate it. If in our further discussions uh, we have additional questions, I am grateful for your offer to, for us to be able to consult with you and get more input as needed. Actually, I'm, okay. I'm sorry, just a second. Mr. Green, I think I might have another question from may, Mark may Johnson. May I ask one question? Please. Uh, Mr. Green, thanks for your uh, participation today. When you talk about a board that regulates a profession comprised of active market participants, do you see a distinction between uh, our board where the active market participants are licensed by the Supreme Court and not by the board or the legislature itself. Does that make any sense to you? <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, I, I, I think I think I understand the question, and then so you mentioned. I me. think that, 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 that. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, so the, the 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 question is ultimately what what, what do you have to do to con, com, to invoke the, the state action antitrust exemption. If if the group it's by we're licensed by the Supreme Court. I'm sorry. Right now, so if the, if the group that's making the decision are active market participants, uh, for example, if they are lawyers, it does not matter whether this decision making group is appointed by the legislature or by the Supreme Court or even if it was elected by by lawyers. They, if they are active market participants participants, then the method of selection would not affect the antitrust analysis. Okay, so it's, so it's licensed, uh, licensed by, the, I think you said the active market participants, licensed by the board and then a person pro who provides services uh, subject to the regulatory authority of the board. But in our case, I think both those, you know, I, I think the Supreme Court is, is the uh, regulatory authority, not the board. Uh, primarily, and we're licensed by the Supreme Court, not the board. It, it, does that create a distinction in your mind between the Washington State Bar Association with the plenary authority of our Supreme Court over our practices and the North Carolina Dental Board and the teeth whitening issue? Okay, so to the extent that a decision or action is taken by the Supreme Court, it's exempt. The extent that it's the, this the bar that that that, it, that is taking that is taking action, uh, that, then it it would need to be supervised, and uh, so that, so then you get into these questions of you know, demonstrating that demonstrating this this supervision. Does that, does that answer your question? Sure. You know, so, so again, the fact the, the fact that the, the fact that the, that this, if this, if the fact that the Supreme Court is investing in a group of market participants 
the authority to regulate would, would, would not of itself be sufficient to exempt you from the antitrust laws. The, the Supreme Court is sovereign. It is treated differently, but it cannot convey that sovereignty to any, to any other group. Mr. Green, Eileen Farley had another question, please. Well, this is, sure. this is just a follow-up, I think, on Mr. Johnson's. Could it be that that supervision is perhaps not directly from the Supreme Court, but, for example, if there was a referral for an unlawful practice of law and an elected prosecutor were to make the decision whether or not to um, prosecute, would that be a... a sufficient intervention or review or supervision of that decision to uh, provide some protection or to mitigate any possible anti-competition? So, I mean, so, well, w w w one, w one way you could structure a regulatory regime is to have a, a, a prosecutor uh, bring a case before a state court, and then the, the state court would be the the actor responsible for, say, excluding somebody from the practice of law, from stripping somebody of their license, so it, rather than the the bar association. And and so yes, if if the if the, if the state court is is responsible for 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 excluding somebody, then you would you would not be uh, the actor. Then the bar association is not the actor responsible for the exclusion. So, in that scenario, the bar association is not liable under the antitrust laws. And the decision of the of the of the the court, if it was assuming it was a de novo review uh, of, of whether somebody had violated his responsibilities, that this. The state court is, is, is itself not a, a market participant and would, would not be liable in antitrust. So, you know, so it, and, you know going back to North, North Carolina, the, the North Carolina Dental Board could have, under its legislation, prosecuted the non-dentist teeth whiteners for practicing dentistry without a license. And had they done that, uh, brought their action in, in state court, they would not have run into an antitrust problem. The reason that they were found to have violated the antitrust laws was because the dental board of its own authority ordered the non-dentist providers to cease providing services. Thank you. Mr. Green, I see no other questions from the work group. So, again, thank you very much for your uh, participation and information. We greatly appreciate your time and your um, information. So, thank you and have a wonderful evening. You too. Good luck in your deliberations. Thank you very much.